Ivy Nation Sports Talk up and rolling with the Rapid Fire Show on this Friday. Glad to have you with us. It's just a two-man show today. Jesse disappointed us. Not not here. Not here today. Yeah, I you know, I I feel, I guess, I don't know if the word is betrayed, <laughs> but I feel a little betrayed, and I feel like we kind of fell a couple of rungs on the ladder. I'm just saying. I guess I, so. I don't I know. So. I don't know how I feel about it. I'm still kind of processing my emotions on the whole thing. Not that you I and I can't handle it, but... I enjoy I enjoy uh, Friday fires with the three of us. I know it's a lot you of know? fun, good well, times. So I even wore my Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, shirt in honor of, you know, it's in Cleveland, Cleveland in yes. honor of the, the Final Four and Jesse and Cleveland and all that. They got friends from out of town or something, blah, you know, blah, coming in. Blah. I know. Speaking of of out of town, when you go to a hotel, Vince. Oh, I was just in one last night. Go ahead. Were you really? Do mm-hmm. you put your clothes in the dresser? Do you keep them in your bag? How do you usually do it? Solid question. Solid question. <laughs> um, I am usually a suitcase guy. I don't usually unpack at mm-hmm. all. Um, it, it would have to be the only time it even comes into play is if we are going to be in a hotel for a week. You know what I mean? But still, extended stay of yes. some, you know, like yes. longer than just a night or two kind of thing. <clears throat> but like, you know, we go someplace for a week in the summer every year. I was out of my suitcase last year. Right. Uh, my kids, they drawer it. They they go full drawer like they're moving in. Really? Yes, they Interesting. do. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, they, and they argue about who gets what drawer, you know, yeah. that kind of a thing. Yeah. Like if I travel with my wife, like I don't even have to. It's just we get there and the next thing you know, the whole bag's unpacked and stuff <laughs> in the closets and drawers and <laughs> everything else. But like when I'm traveling with basketball – during the season typically i just i keep it in the bag because it's like one night over but you know it's not 100%. a whole lot of things but like last week and like acc tournament a few weeks ago you have to plan like you're going to be in town for five days basically so you got to take a lot of extra stuff and so last week i actually <laughs> took the time put Did the stuff really? in the drawers but then guess what happened you lost or you didn't well, lose they oh. lost we came you forgot home. something didn't you I forgot a lot of things is what I forgot. <laughs> and I just had to roll over to Notre Dame today to pick it up. They The hotel actually mailed oh. it back over to Notre Dame. So, Well, that's I, good. I had like, I, you know, I'm packing my bag and I'm like, you know, when we were leaving last week, I'm like, man, it doesn't seem like this bag is as full as I remember, you know? And then it's you know, when I was throwing stuff, you know, doing the wash the next day, unpacking the bag. I'm like, oh, my God, I forgot <laughs> all this stuff in the hotel in oh, Albany. No. Yeah, so fortunately, <clears throat> one of the players actually left a laptop behind. I'm not going to say any names, but they, wow. so they had to mail the laptop anyway. So they just threw my all like wow. all of my clothes. And it was a lot. Because like, <laughs> they, they gave it to me in this box today. And I'm like, man, that box is heavy. And then I unpacked it. It's like, man, I took a lot more stuff then <laughs> that's hilarious i thought i did that's a lot my the the my son stayed in a hotel a couple of nights ago and he left his shampoo and you know these these kids are you know very finicky about their shampoo sure. and it's not inexpensive and he he left that uh in a very far away city so he's not getting that shampoo back that's for sure no no, he's not. And there have been, so, you know, there have been times I've left things before and not gotten them back, you know. Oh, absolutely. Basically, absolutely. basically the mm-hmm. hotel staff snatched them up and they're like, oh, we never <laughs> saw them. I'm like, oh, that's funny because. Yeah, I know exactly where it was. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Whatever. Uh, speaking of uh, Notre Dame women's basketball, I don't know if you saw today, Hannah Hidalgo received the Don Staley Award. Staley, of course, is the head coach at. South Carolina. She was a yeah. star player, two time, yeah, two time national player of the year uh, back when she was playing at Virginia. It goes to the best guard in the nation every year. Caitlin Clark had won it the last three years. Hannah Hidalgo snatched it from her. This Interesting. Year. I yeah. that I did not know, and yeah. that's actually pretty impressive considering this is the culmination of Caitlin Clark's year. Yeah, exactly. I mean, or of her career. Excuse me. Uh, I I am shocked by that. Not that it wasn't deserving by Hannah, because she's obviously a very, 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 very good guard, but she has been overlooked for some other things. So, right, I'm surprised. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised 
as well. She is the it's the third time a Notre Dame player has won it. The the award's only been around since 2012. Skylar Diggins won it. Now Skylar Diggins Smith, of course, but she won it the first two years of its existence. And this is the okay. uh, time since 2013 that a Notre Dame player has won it. So huh. pretty impressive. To what be do you know? This thing. Yeah. No kidding. You know, especially again, like best guard in the nation, Caitlin Clark, three times running and goes to Hannah Hidalgo this year. So it's like the, uh, the LeBron James uh, syndrome. Like they don't want to name the same player four times in a row Maybe or not. whatever. I, you Maybe know, not. but uh, Hey, good for her. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, a lot of football to talk. Let's just get into it. We've got more basketball final fours coming up in a little bit as well. Of course, the women's games tonight, men's games tomorrow. We'll get into that in a little bit. Let's start with some Notre Dame football though. Wide receiver head, uh, wide receiver head coach, wide receiver coach. He's the head coach of his position. It's head okay. coach of the wide receivers. Yes. yes. Mike Brown discussed this week what the Irish receiver rotation, what how he envisions it this season. Here's what Mr. Brown had to say about that. In the perfect world, mm -hmm. uh, I'd say six. Right, has got to be six deserving guys. You're not going to get through a season with six. Uh, you hope you do. You know <laughs> what I mean? You, you may, you may not. We have in the past. But, you know, that's the point of rotating, right? When you try to only play three guys and you're playing, and if you're playing with three receivers on the field, like that stuff wears on you now and you start to get down a stretch. So you got to have a, a good, healthy rotation. And I think it's hard to rotate more than two guys at a specific position. Mm -hmm. But, like you said, I mean, injuries are 100% in football, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you got to have guys that are ready. So you, in a perfect world, you say you got six guys that you feel really, really good about. Uh, you got a seven and maybe an eight that you know can fill in and, and, and roll how you need them. Hopefully there's eight you feel great about, and then you well, get a lot a, of problems. I mean, there's, right? there's a ton of competition for those yeah. six spots, right? There is. There well, is. Our friend Tim Priester chiming in there with a couple of follow-up questions there in the middle. So what do you think about it, Vince? Six-man rotation, Mike Brown is talking about it, wide receiver. Well, I think ideally that is exactly the number that you want to have because it's a manageable number, right? It's a two deep at each position. Correct. You know, you're not always going to be in 11 personnel, and so sometimes that shrinks down even more. Um, you know, are we going to see four wide receivers at times? Maybe. But I think six <clears throat> is an ideal. You know, he's, he's looking at it from his point of view, right? Trying to get guys playing time. And, and if he's saying that you're going to be in the rotation, he's got to be able to get you snaps, right? So um, I think six is ideal on game day. I think that six could rotate. I think you could see, in, in other words, like... Is so it, it might not be the same six, six all the exactly. time. Exactly. I, th I think, I think maybe that could go game to game. That could go, you know, depending on the scouting report, you know, whatever the case may be. Um but I think six is a good number. I really do. When you get into like seven, eight, nine, like you're not, there's only one ball and you're not going to make everybody happy and that's not going to work out too well. And I realize they're going to have, I think, 11 legit scholarship receivers. Correct. Right? And so you're saying six, that's, I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not Jesse, but that's almost <laughs> half um, that aren't going to be playing. Um, and and so, that's but, why I yeah. thought six was a little bit light. When he said okay. this number, I thought it was a little bit light, especially when you consider you do have so many guys who are back, who have experience, as well as these transfers that you brought in. You know, like if we go through it here yeah. a little bit, at field receiver, in theory, you've got Chris Mitchell, the FIU guy sitting at the top of the depth chart, and then K.K. Smith, Cam Williams. So there's there's your first three. You got four guys for the slot, Jaden Greathouse, Jordan Faison, who I think we all pretty much assume like that those, you know, those first two guys there are going right. to be heavy in the rotation. Then you got Jaden Harrison and the incoming freshman Logan Soldata. But like if you go back and, and you count Mitchell, okay, so you got Mitchell. We all assume he's going to be in there. Great house and Faison. So there you got three. And then at boundary, you got Bo Collins, Jaden Thomas, Dion Colsey, and Micah Gilbert. And so again, you know, you've got Collins coming in from Clemson, and we expect him to be an impact type guy. And then you've got Thomas and Colsey with, you know, varying levels. And then you've got Gilbert, who's been flashing out there in the spring, you know. So, like, you get to six pretty quickly, really. Well, not real quickly, I guess. Well, but, you pretty know, quickly, yeah. though. I mean, like Mitchell, you... Great House, Faison. There's your first three. Collins gets you four. Thomas is five. And then real. So I 
you know, like when you look at it like that, I think six probably makes sense. But whoever it's, that six guy is, it's it's a good problem to have. You know, in the past, it's been like, well, they got four. So who else can they sneak in and make it five or six? You know what I mean? Like, that's how it's been in the past. And so I feel like, you know, the tables have turned a little bit, at least from a depth chart standpoint for wide receivers. Now they've got options and there's going to be guys that are going to get their feelings hurt. And hopefully that makes them work harder. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the goal, right? I mean, right. I, that's what I would hope anyway. And so I think six is a good number. I really do. I, if it gets bigger than six, you're going to have trouble keeping everybody happy. If it gets, if it gets bigger than six, because yes. then, because then you've got like six. two or three guys who aren't playing as opposed to four or five. And then, right. you know, it's like, well, why am I the only one sitting over exactly. here? Exactly. Not getting and out there on the field. The odds of there not being an injury somewhere, you know, throughout the year are slim. Somebody's going to get hurt, right? Whoever that. And that's the thing. Be. Like, like, you know, you heard, you know, the follow-ups there from, from Priester, like, someone's going to get banged up at some, you know, just look at last year. You had multiple guys, unfortunately getting banged up and you, know, right, you, hope, right. you obviously hope that it doesn't come to that. So it will get deeper at some point, but I do wonder when you're talking about a rotation of six, like what, you know, we are living in the transfer portal era, right? Right. You know, like right. what, what the end of this spring looks like potentially. That's a great question. And I think they're going to keep it nice and fluid. Uh, at least they should keep it <laughs> as nice much and as possible, right? <laughs> through through spring, because <clears throat> you do want to have that cushion, right? They can absorb a couple of injuries, and that's okay, right? But if they start losing guys to the portal, that's going to be a bigger yes. problem. So you, you want to be able to keep as many as they possibly can. To answer the question from the chat, yes, Matt Salerno is gone now. He is he is no longer here. Um, Jarrett asking any opinions on a wide receiver becoming a special teams ace like Claypool was. And we kind of were talking about this with Jaden Harrison the other day. It might've been when Jesse and I were, uh, was it Jesse and I, or, or was it you and I, when we were talking about the kickoff returner being involved oh. in a lot of special teams, it was you and I. That's it, what... Yeah, it was us. And yeah, that. Could there be somebody? Absolutely. But I think the best part about how deep this roster is, is you don't have to necessarily have somebody that is a starting wide receiver be on a bunch of different special teams. You can, if they're the best ones for the job, but they're so deep. Now this roster looks completely different top to bottom than it did when Chase Claypool was here. Right. And so he had to, if they wanted to have elite special teams, I don't think that that's really the case right now. But so. I do like the idea of a guy like him, as as we talked about, just like Devin Ford last year, and probably what Devin Ford will also do this year. Like, just because you're the kickoff returner doesn't mean you shouldn't be on some of those other special teams. And when and when you can, we I think we said it. You know, you're you're essentially getting your money's worth out of that scholarship that you're given to a guy who's who's predominantly going to be like his main thing is being a kickoff returner. Talking about Harrison specifically but he's going to fill a lot of different special teams roles is what marty biagi was saying so i like that you, know, and you, you yeah, brought sure. in guys the last two years and i think as long as marty biagi is here that's that's kind of part of his vision i think is you bring some of those guys in who can fill a lot of different special teams roles so i'm getting banged on on oh no logan Saldat. however we say the end of his name Soldate, soldati, like Obladi, Obladi, Obladi. Yes, yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Look, he's not here. I have not seen an official pronunciation guide on right. They Logan's haven't given it to us yet. Last yeah. name, and uh, you know, I've said this before. If you're listening to the big guys shows during the day, just because he says a name one way doesn't mean that's how yeah. it's pronounced this is this is true trust me on that this is true i could you know if, if i really wanted to call him out i could throw out a couple just off the top of my head oh that boy he says wrong all the time but i'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole <laughs> my guy i'm just saying i'm just saying i i know what you're saying don't base your pronunciation guide on what he's saying if that's <laughs> if that's what you're going off right you know i'm having fun but it's also true right <laughs> okay so before I play this next clip, 
from Mike Brown. The question is, what separates wide receiver number six from wide receiver number seven when we're talking about this, you know, this this rotation? Right. What do you think the answer is before I before I give it? Here? Well, I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Yeah, you are. But I, I read I gave you a heads so I up. This was coming as well. I, I knew it was coming, but <laughs> I think it varies. That's the thing, you know, depending on what position you're trying to get the seventh one on there, right? Between six and seven. And so I think it has to be, uh, you know, a guy you can trust. Number one, I think it also has to be what's your skill set? Is it different than some other what some other guys have, you know, to bring to the table? I think that's important. I want as many unique skill sets as possible, okay. but I also want to be able to trust you. So there you go. That's my answer. So what is the answer? Is it trust? Is trust your answer? Oh, well, those are my two, right? <laughs> so yeah, I get trust, like, trust is my answer. Yes, trust, trust. is my answer. Okay. Yes, I will go with trust. All yes. right. Here's what Mike Brown said. Consistency, man. And I think that's what separates any of them, right? Consistency and... and playmaking ability, right? knowing what you're doing, knowing why you're doing it, and uh, being able to do it at a high level on a consistent basis. I mean, you were in the ballpark. Yeah, the consistency. consistency. Uh, you, know. you know, I think that's pretty good. Yeah. I think that's good. Yeah. I mean, I think we especially hear this about receivers all the time, right? Consistency being part of the deal. But I'll be curious to see kind of what this looks like you know, like we talked about, they don't have to lean on freshmen this year the way they did last year, whether or not Micah Gilbert or Logan S., you know, how he's doing, those kind of things. Uh, DK says you trust that, that you yes. trust those that are consistent. Yes. Thank you, DK. 100%. Yes. It's not bad. Like I said. It's in the I ballpark. was in the neighborhood. Yeah, I was yeah. in the neighborhood. And I, how do you earn the trust through consistency? Yes, right. Absolutely. There you go. Tommy, Tommy is begging me to do it. Do what? Going back to what we were just talking about with the pronunciation. Oh, well, yeah. Let me just say that the head coach of the Notre Dame women's basketball team's first name is pronounced Niel. Ask Brian how to pronounce it. That's not what he's going to say. <laughs> not touching that one either. <laughs> I'm not even sure how he says it now. I'm going it through my head. It's okay. Do you want me to say it? Sure. <laughs> he says Niel. Does he say Nye? Okay, that's yes. the only other way I could think of it. Yes. It drives me nuts every time. No matter how many times I say Niel, he will still say Niel. Oh, boy. Come on. Come on, BD. Come Love on. you, man. But, you know, I just... <laughs> Got to call it what it is, right? It's true. <laughs> huh? Truth. Nope, you're there. I'm the, I'm with you. Uh, okay, so Jaden Greathouse, speaking of wide receivers, here we go. Salty's ears are going to perk up now. I see Salty's back in the house, and Salty was going crazy when we had a little Jaden Greathouse yesterday, but uh, he's got a new... Quarterback in town, just like everybody else. Riley Leonard, of course, even though he's a little banged up right now, but he was, as we have talked about this week, he was practicing this week. Here's what Jaden Greathouse, though, has to say about the Duke transfer, Riley Leonard. He got a strong arm for sure. Um, he's a big guy and uh, definitely has a cannon for sure, but he's definitely accurate as well. Um, and he could definitely put that ball on a rope um, and put it in the spots that it needs to be. Um, and it's, it's definitely, definitely exciting. Um, and I just hope that he comes back out soon. So Jaden Greathouse, oh, he's shaking his head. Vince is shaking his head. What are you shaking your he... head about? Well, because I know the question that's coming. Okay. So, so is yeah. that enough to satisfy the Leonard's not accurate crowd? No, it's not because that's the narrative, man. That, that That's know. the thing. Like, I it doesn't know. matter if every single receiver comes out and says every he's, pass he's ever thrown has been perfect to me. Right. It's not going to silence the crowd because that's the narrative about Riley Leonard is that he's inaccurate and it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I, oh, it's ridiculous. I agree. I, I couldn't agree more. Everyone's mm. still going to have their opinion. It's not going to matter what. 
you know, what the actual guys who are catching passes from him say, even though like, wasn't Sam Hartman supposed to be pretty accurate? He was, he was what, like 61%, uh, 63% last year. That's basically what, what Riley Leonard was two years ago in his full season. You know, he was 57% last year, but what was he? He was injured. He had that ankle. He had some issues with the ankle. So, you know, I, Vince disappeared on me all of a sudden. I have no idea what just happened. <laughs> and What's he's up? back. What's up? <sighs> I was just talking about Hartman's completion percentage. Okay. Compared to Riley Leonard's completion percentage. Because Hartman was 63% last year. Leonard was 63% two years ago in his full year as a starter. And... You know, he was obviously injured last year, so I don't think you can base too much of what we saw last year. Now, you know, it's practice, a lot of it's versus air, but what we've seen so far, I've got I've got zero reason to, you know, to to worry about the accuracy we're gonna see from Riley Leonard. Well, no, and and we we've seen enough not, well, okay. I take it back. I have not seen enough in practice to just get me on my high horse on my pedestal and be like He's one of the most accurate quarterbacks I've ever seen. Da, 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 da. Right. We're not going that far. Here's the thing. But... With the skill set that he brings, if he's 100% healthy, he doesn't need to be an 80% quarterback. We've he talked about this be. before. We, like Guys like him, the mobile quarterbacks, tend to have a little bit less accuracy. But what are you going to do? They're going to make up for it with what they bring with what you're talking about. They're going to make up for it by Mm -hmm. the addition of what they bring with their legs. If you've got a quarterback who can pass for 3,000 yards and complete 62, 63%, but oh, by the way, he's also going to run for between 800 yards and 1,100 yards. It's a pretty good trade-off to have, right? That's what I'm saying. And and he's going to be throwing to pretty good-sized windows because of what he brings to the table with his legs and because of what the run game can bring to the table offensively. You know what I'm saying? And so he doesn't need to be that all. He doesn't need to be Jimmy Clausen from an accuracy standpoint. His arm is strong enough to get to the ball where it needs to go. Correct. And it's accurate enough to get the ball to where it needs to go. And here's the other thing. He's got talent at wide receiver that he's never had in his career. Okay. Some of those misses are drops. Because they, he didn't have the talent that he's going to have at Notre Dame. Right. So that needs to be taken into account as well. And so I just, people have just hung on to that narrative, man. And they're just not going to let it go. The only time it really becomes an issue, I think, especially at the college level, is when you get into those two minute situations. You're kind of trying to run a two minute offense, especially if it's at the end of the game and you're trying to come back or you know, you fall behind by a couple of touchdowns and you've got to, you know, then you need to throw the ball a little bit more. But again, in a, in a normal situation, you know, like look at that Clemson game, what he did last year, you know, with, with, with the big run, one of the highlights of the season, you know, right. That's, that's what you can expect from Riley Leonard. He didn't have his best passing game that day, but they still beat Clemson in large part because he could run the football. Yeah, and because of the defense that Duke had too, but from an offensive standpoint, like he he carried them to the victory against Clemson. Got yeah, I completely agree. He he just brings so much to the table, both with his legs and with his arm, and with the fact that he's going to end up being like a three and a half year starter as well. So I mean, he brings a lot to the table, and he's got Mike Denbrock in his back pocket, you know, steering the ship. So. I just, it just doesn't like the, oh, he's so inaccurate. It, that that just doesn't do anything for me right now. I'm more, more worried about his ankle than anything else. If that's 100% healthy by the time the season rolls around, I have no issues whatsoever. Wow. What? <laughs> Where did this come from? <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, I, said, I want Ian Book back. Like, I assume that there's, He's being facetious with with that, but I would um, hope so. Like if you've listened to any of these shows, Vince, Vince, you seem a little winded there. You doing well, okay? Uh, it. <laughs> so a coach was trying to get a hold of my son. Okay, and my son is two floors up 
asleep oh, because brother. there's nothing going on. It's so everybody's break. yelling at you to come answer the phone or something. And or? It's just me and him in the in the house. Everybody <laughs> else is still on vacation. <laughs> and so the coach is like, he needs to call me in the next 10 minutes. And I'm like, I'm doing a live show. I'll have to try to get him to call you. Right. And so I had to, I ran up two flights of stairs. <laughs> Wake up. And then made him come down and call. So that's how that went. And so, yes, I was a little out of breath. Uh, that's hilarious. Not used to doing uh, stadium steps uh, and, and then coming back and doing part of a live show. Well, because so, I kind uh, of flipped my screen for a second. I was looking at something. The next thing I know, you're gone. I'm like, oh my gosh, your chair's hoping, empty. <laughs> yeah, you were talking. I was like, okay, he's going to say something. I need like 30 seconds. And, and then I, I like, see Whoop! you sit down and you've got yourself muted. And I Oof. thought you were like, Ma, the meatloaf. We need it now. I tried that once that the voice did not carry two flights, it did not wake him up. So, yeah, the joys of being a parent when there's nobody else home. Yeah, Vince is in the basement. Yes. That's why it's typically, you know, he typically doesn't have a whole lot of distractions. That's how he stays yes. away from the fray. This is the true. The Dario household fight. Yes, this is true. This is true. Barricading himself downstairs. <laughs> and it's it's a noise thing. It's a me being too loud thing. It's a whole it's a whole thing. And he's, like I said, two flights up. And I knew it. I knew he was going to be sleeping when I, I couldn't get a hold. I'm, I'm texting him. I tried to call him while we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Like, I had to yell into his, into his bedroom. He's like, whoa. Like, he totally startled him. He had no idea. It's just 17 years old, man. Like, that's Gotta just love how it. it works. Gotta you know? love it. Those were the yeah. days. Uh-huh. Yep. So, anyway, thanks for... uh Right in the ship while I was gone. Appreciate you. No problem. But I'm That's here right. for the duration now, baby. Glad to have you back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we've got men's and women's final fours this weekend. Yes, you got we do. UConn and NC State, both the men and women are in. Purdue men, Alabama men, and of course, Iowa and South Carolina women's teams competing. Which of those teams most needs a championship this weekend? So I was thinking about this in my head, and I, I kind of picked one women and men. So I got, I've got two. Okay. On the women's side, I think it's Iowa. I don't think they're ever going to have another opportunity to be in this position again because obviously – Completely Kate, agree. You've got, Clark's a you've got generational a player. Multi-generational player. Yeah, right. that's right. So they're never going to have her again, and they're going to have a hard time. Like, they're, they're, they'll get some recruits out of this. There's no doubt about it. There's plenty of young girls – that are but not, not seeing Iowa and you're not gonna get another Caitlin Clark. It's correct. not like it's not like UConn, you know, right. where you just exactly where you roll through right. five stars, you know, yep. and you're getting the the you know the number one ranked player on average yeah. every other year, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so on the men's side, though, I'm going with Purdue because what is Purdue? Purdue is a basketball school, a men's basketball school specifically. Okay. And it used they, to be a women's basketball school, ironically, it, like 25 right. years ago. Remember, yes, they won a national championship and then, of course, lost in another one just two years later. But I mean, they're they're clearly never going to be a football school again with the way that everything is going with the Big Ten and everything else. Even when Drew Brees was there, they weren't a football school. Right. And so basketball is their thing. And they need a title like they, they need. I mean, they'll always be relevant, but they need a title. I'm not saying that I love Purdue. That's not the point I'm making, <laughs> D-Troll Hunter. I'm just saying they need a title. Look, their coach is a good coach. Mm -hmm. I, I actually – I respect him as a coach. I, I couldn't stand the comb over before. <laughs> he really right. annoyed me. I know. Uh, me too. <laughs> but I, I have changed my tune on the current uh, head coach. He, he deserves some respect, and uh, I, I think they've got the players to do it. And if they want to maintain kind of a national relevance, national status, I think they need a title here. You know, I think they need a title. NC State would be a flash in the pan. UConn has a bunch of titles. They're already a blue blood. You know what I mean? Alabama, that would be a flash in the pan. They're not going to yeah. be national relevance. Purdue needs this more than the other ones do. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. Like because like you look at Alabama, it's obviously a football school. You know, it's it's oh, just it'll a nice never little, be a basketball. School. A, yeah, it's a nice little story that Alabama's Correct. in the Final Four. To begin with, you know, like I would venture to guess like our type of show down there is going to get more listenership talking about spring ball than they are about basketball. Oh, you're exactly right. Final, going to the final yeah. four. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, so, yeah, that they don't care. Yep. 
I completely agree on both counts with what you're saying. They Purdue men, Iowa women need it the most because it, you know, look, look how long it's been since either one of them has had this kind of relevance. It's been 44 years since Purdue last went to a final four. And as you said, I was never going to have a player like Caitlin Clark again, especially a homegrown player and the whole thing. As you, it, it, you know, again, as you said, th- they're going to get a little bit higher recruiting profile, oh, you know, over the next, you know, couple of cycles probably because of Caitlin Clark, but they're not going to have Caitlin Clark again. So it's those two easily for me. And I, I honestly, those are going to be the ones I'm rooting for to be, I mean, that's, that's just kind of how I feel going into this whole thing. Cause I don't, you know, I don't have a dog in the fight in any of the teams. Uh, and I always have to have somebody to root for. Those are the two teams that I'm going to be rooting for. No doubt about it. The problem is, one game's gonna be on a little late for me tonight. I know. That's a rough. That's rough, man. And that that's that's rough. You're trying yeah. to grow the game, and you're gonna put a game on at nine thirty. Come on, man. A little surprised. It's well, we'll kind of get into that because yeah. it'll play into a couple of the things we're gonna talk about here in a minute. So, some over unders for Caitlin Clark in tonight's game against UConn. Thirty three and a half points is her point over under. Nine and a half assists. Five and a half made three pointers. Those are her over unders. Uh, on the old uh, sports wagering apps. So which of those three are you most confident that she she will go over tonight against UConn? I mean, I think it's the three pointers to be honest with you, but it's like a domino effect. If, if it is the three, if the three pointers is a yes, then I think she goes over on points as well. You know, does that make sense? Like, yeah, one, obviously, I mean, obviously if she other. hits nine, three pointers again, that's 27 points alone. Right. right. There, so, and she's yeah. going to get to the free throw line too. So, yeah, you know, I, so yeah, but I think if I'm putting them in order of where I think they're going to be, I think it'll be three pointers points, then assists. If I'm being honest, I think she probably goes over on all of them just because it feels <laughs> like, because it feels like this stage and against this program and the whole thing, like, she didn't have a great first half against LSU Monday night, but she, she ended up going over on all of these. You know, she ended up scoring 41 points and 15 assists and nine three pointers. She's only gone over once on the three pointers in the last seven games, but mm-hmm. I believe it was against Ohio State. You know, so again, I just feel like the stakes are high. That feels like a pretty safe one to me. The assists, though, is probably where I'm going. She's been a little bit more consistent with the assists. And I think that that's the thing. Not only does she need to score against UConn, but I think that she needs to get her the rest of her team involved tonight if they're going to have a sure. chance. So it feels to me like the assists are, are are the safest bet over nine and a half assists. She's gone over two of the last three. Uh, oh, over in the last two and in three of the last four games okay. on the nine and a half assists. Well, I will say this. My first watching of Iowa all year was against LSU. And I knew nothing about anybody else on the team going in. Now, I also realized that basketball is a team game and all of those different things. But that's how most people are with that team. But you know, it's I, like Caitlin I was in Clark and the other. Yeah, four. exactly. Right. <laughs> you, know? It, you know, right. It's the, the four horsemen and the seven mules. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like right. it's, it's that type of a situation. And I get it and I understand it. But I was very impressed with the supporting cast. Like those girls can play, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm sure that has been the recruiting pitch for the Iowa staff is like, come play with Caitlin Clark and you'll be on the national stage. And they've obviously done a good job of bringing in talent. Her supporting cast is legit. There, there's no doubt about that. I, I was impressed with the way they played. They knocked down some clutch threes and, mm-hmm. you know, I, I was very impressed with them. And so I also agree that they're all going to need to step up. Look, their number up. one job is to be to be ready when when Caitlin Clark yeah. passes them the ball yeah. and to space the floor to give her the space to do what she needs to do and but as you saw Monday night she doesn't necessarily you know she doesn't need to be wide open <laughs> to take shots when you can hit right. from 30 feet away with a hand in your face you don't need to be wide open but their main job is to just space the floor and be ready for a pass from Caitlin Clark and hit the shot when it comes to you yep you know yeah. And then rebound every now and then as well. 100%. So. It's like playing with Pistol Pete. You always got to have your hands up. That's right. Have them ready. You That's know? That's right. I mean, that was the biggest adjustment a couple of years ago when Olivia Miles came in. Was yes. like yeah. players took a while. It's like, oh, 
oh, I could get the ball at any minute when Olivia Miles, you know, has the ball, you know, and that's, that's, you know, just another reason that I'm looking forward to seeing her back. In oh, yeah. Again. No year. doubt. It's going to be that much more fun. Paige Becker's point over under is 26 and a half. I'm, I'm feeling under on this. Yeah. That was my first inclination as well. Yeah. I, you didn't put it up here, but my first inclination was under. Absolutely. I, I think that they're going to do it. This was a late ad. I felt like her. I should probably add Paige no, Becker to this after I sent it. <laughs> no, you're good. I, 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 my instinct is under. I'll, I'll say that. My I'm the same. Is under. Yep. Yeah. Same way. And, you know, their team not quite as deep as Iowa's. They've had some injuries that they've had to deal with this year, but they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're very talented. So I think yeah. there's a, there's some other players like Aaliyah Edward, you know, like that can score as well. Purdue NC State. Zach Eady's over under is 26 and a half. Just like Paige Beckers, actually. What do you think about Edie? Here's, let me, let, I'll let you chew on this. Okay. He, he's coming off a 40 point game against Tennessee, and he's gone over on this number in eight of the last 10 games. Yeah. Th this number's low for me. And I think they're giving an awful lot of credit uh, to Burns from NC State that he's going to be able to do something to Edie, you know, from a defensive standpoint. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> These, look, if, if Twitter, is any indication uh files get called on ed when people look at him cross-eyed true you imagine what it's going to be like when a 300 pound guy keeps bumping into him true you know they, he might snap ed like a twig you know uh so i i see him getting to the free throw line a lot he's a pretty good free throw shooter it feels like mm -hmm. i don't know that i don't have the stats in front of Solid. me just from, just from yeah. watching for a big guy um and i i think he's going to be able to get his points I, I i would take the over there as well yeah i mean i think it's easily over on this one. The only thing is like, you know, how much does Burns affect him in that kind of stuff? But it just feels like with that, just with the, you know, the, the height, not the yeah. girth, obviously, like, but he's just been able to do almost whatever he wants through this tournament. And they need him, basically. Oh, yeah. You know? So Burns over under is only 13 and a half. He only averages 13 a game, which surprised me a little bit, considering, you know, as as prominent as he has been in yeah. this tournament run. He's the one guy I've seen play in person. I wasn't all that impressed with him offensively. He's good for a big guy. You know what I mean? Like he, he's got decent feed and all of those different things. I think he's going to be in for a long night playing against Zach Eady and his height and length and all that stuff. And so I would actually take the under here. I don't think he's going to hit his average. I think that, you know, NC state's hopes come to a screeching halt in the he final had 29 four. and i think that that's kind of what stands out to me watching most of that or at least the second half of nc state duke he had 29 against duke but he only had four points a game before that against marquette which right. like if you said that burns was only going to have four against marquette i wouldn't have wouldn't have given nc state much of a chance Fair. to win but he's had at least 15 points in six of the last seven i think this is one that i'm not touching um but it Fair. feels like it feels like an under but at the same time this number is so low. That's that's why I don't think I would want to touch this one at 13 and a half. That's fair. That's fair. I, yeah. I just don't see him getting a whole lot of yeah, just because anything. of the matchup with Edie. I mean, that's, that's tough. That's that's the big matchup, right? Yeah, that's so. really tough. Really tough. <laughs> DK. Yep, nailed it. Picking Purdue with the first one. You know, again, they're trying they're they're uh I mean, look, that's their track. They're record. on that Virginia run, just like just <clears throat> that's like their track Virginia. record. That yeah. that's what but see, but that's why they need this title right. more than anybody else because their track record has been to be the first one out or a first right. round loss or, or whatever and the let's case not may forget. be. Okay, Virginia became the first number one seed ever to lose to a 16 seed. They turned around and won the national championship the that's next true. year. And remember, like, I don't know if you remember, like, all the little things and there was some controversy, you know, on that three point shot when Virginia won the championship and all that different stuff. They needed all these crazy bounces of the ball to win the title the next year, their track record since winning that championship is not very good. And so when you look at Purdue again, second team to ever lose to a 16 seed last year, now they're in the final four, just because you're here, like back to, you know, to what you were saying, that's why they need this championship. But, and that's why it also was their track record. And there's nothing to say that they're not going to go right back to that track record, especially right. when you lose a guy like Edie next year. Yep, 100%.
So, Will, tonight's Iowa-UConn Final Four semifinal game top Monday's record-setting women's viewership number of 12.3 million viewers? No is the short answer. The longer answer is I don't know that it's even going to be in the hemisphere of that record-breaking night. It's a couple of reasons. <clears throat> First reason, UConn is not the villain that LSU is. They used to be. They used to be the villain, right? Now, remember, though, they still have, like, strong – they have strong – Following or, you know, viewership. Yeah, following. Like, they, they typically are right. the viewership magnet, basically. But G- That's but what Gino, I was to say. Gino is not Kim Mulkey. He used to be. He used to be the the – the uh, the big audio poll where everybody would get pissed off at Gino and everything. Mm-hmm. He hasn't been that guy. I don't know if it's because he's got like grandkids now or whatever, but he's not that guy anymore, at least not overtly in the national media, at least that I've noticed, okay? Well, he's lost <clears throat> more this year. I think that's humbling, <laughs> a little humble pie, uh-huh. that, that, and that's fair. So I don't think they're as villainous as LSU. I think that's part of it because we ta- you and I talked about the hero and the villain and you know, all of that. I don't think there's as much of that in this one. And then the second reason for me is when the game is occurring. It's too late. See, that's the biggest, late that's the biggest question for me. It's the second game. The South Carolina NC state game is the seven yeah. o'clock game. The they list, they list this Iowa Yukon at nine o'clock. There's no way it starts before nine 30, you know, so you're probably talking about closer to nine 40 by the time it's all said and done. And so what are you going to stay up till midnight? You know, right, that's that's going to make it tough for me on a Friday all, night, especially all those young girls that are supposedly wanting to watch and all that. Like Friday night's yeah. not a good viewership night either. It's well, that's you know, true, and it's spring break, so there's going to be people away on spring break, or at least it is around here, right? And so people are still on vacation, and you know that kind of stuff. And that's what I've always said. I South Bend spring break di- dictates. Well, <laughs> it's spring break everywhere. for many high schools and other schools. <laughs> it's spring break season. There's a lot of people yeah. on spring break. There you go. The country. Thank yeah. you. I mean, it's it's a fair point. It is interesting though because while the Iowa LSU game got the 12.3 million viewers, UConn USC was the second game that night. It got 6.7 million that night. Now, it's almost half the number, but what's interesting is, you know, like not as many people into USC as there obviously are going to be in Iowa. And the 6.7 million basically would have been a record for almost any women's national championship game prior to last year when Iowa set the record with that 10.9 or whatever it was. So I'm going to say reluctantly i think it gets there i think it gets to really? at least 12 million i don't think that it like a lot of people are trying to predict it's going to put put up around 14 15 million something wow. like that i think it gets right around 12 but i don't think it gets much north of that i'm predicting nine because of i mean i agree i think that the time thing is going to be a factor time on a friday night i think it's going to factor into this nine million you heard You're it saying here first. nine okay yep. that's where i'm going okay i'm taking 12 still it's going to be right, right. In the okay. Because this could be Caitlin Clark's last game. So I think that could there'll be. still be it a lot be, of people. It could be. could be. Could be. So do you buy or sell tonight's Iowa UConn game getting a better TV rating than either of the men's semifinal games Saturday night? Yes, I do. I do think that that might be the case. I, and here, and the reason why for me is that you don't have your, tra- I mean, UConn is a traditional blue blood now. They they are because of how much they've won. Okay. But they don't have they're not going to have the viewership of a Duke or a North Carolina or whatever. And so you just don't have that Red Sox, Yankees. You just don't have that team in the final four. And so I don't I don't think the viewership is going to be super high. And so the push is for the women right now, to be honest. And so I, I think that that number actually will be higher than both the men's semifinals than both of the men's okay i think the yukon alabama has a chance i don't think purdue nc state is going to push the needle much big thing to remember and like if you're planning on watching the games this weekend you know saturday and monday this is important we'll probably have to mention this again but the the game the men's games are not on cbs this year they're yeah. alternating cbs tbs so it's on cable on tbs i saw that 
So that is very important. Like I thought that was a mistake, actually. Yeah, well, it's part of their contract, yeah. though. That's that's the way they're doing it. They're they're alternating back and forth. The Duke NC State Elite Eight game last weekend on CBS had 15.1 million. Purdue, Tennessee, 10.4 million. So again, it's like I think I think Purdue, Tennessee is pretty comparable to what you're gonna get with Purdue NC State, even though it's a final four game this weekend. Two years ago, Kansas, North Carolina in the national championship on TBS, 18.1 million. So See, those, like, those that's two, the national like, championship. And those game. are two blue blood. Two blue blood like, as you can get playing yes. for a national championship. So right. I agree. I think that I think that Iowa Yukon women's game tonight gets at least better ratings than the Purdue NC State game tomorrow night. Maybe, okay. maybe both of them. Maybe both of them. I don't know. I'm because both. again, I'm predicting around both. 12 million, but I say it gets at least better ratings than one of them, though. Okay. Fill in the blank. Sunday's women's championship game will be blank if Iowa doesn't beat UConn tonight. Very disappointing. And that will parallel the viewership, right? I mean, UConn is the blue blood for for with the women's game. There's there's no doubt about that. And so they'll pull in whatever demographic that they always pull in. But the Caitlin Clark side of things is just, it's new and it is fresh and it's what, it's the talk, right? And if they don't make it to the national championship game, it's going to be a huge disappointment for everybody involved. Like, Could you imagine if they end up with, with uh, NC State versus UConn Sunday and there'll be crickets. There'll be zero buzz around that game because it's like oh UConn's back at a championship game. yeah great exactly you know? nobody's gonna care yeah except for UConn fans exactly exactly the evil empire that's it yeah I mean it'll be a huge letdown if that happens because all this buzz is obviously primarily generated by Caitlin Clark you know yep so hey and remember South Carolina Iowa would be a rematch from the final four last year too when Iowa beat South Carolina in the semifinals to advance to to play LSU. So like an undefeated South Carolina team against the Caitlin Clark train. I mean, that's obviously the dream matchup that everyone wants. And it's going to be um, Sunday afternoon again as well. And it's going to be on ABC. You know, like mm. think about that. The fact that the men's games are on a cable channel and the women's game is going to be on broadcast ABC Sunday afternoon. Mm. Mm-hmm. So. Okay, so Ringer podcast host Ryan Russillo is getting dumped on because he said on his show this week that he watched the first half of Monday's Iowa LSU game and then turned it off to watch an NBA game. Fair or foul that he's getting bashed over this? I mean, it's fair that he's getting bashed over it, but I'm not in any way surprised. Even back like a decade ago when I used to listen to his radio show, he's always been an NBA guy. Like that has always been his thing. And he's going to pick an NBA game over just about everything. So I don't know that that really, you know what I mean? Like he was going to watch an NBA game regardless. And so I'm actually shocked that he turned on the women's game at all. So (laughs) is it fair that he's getting blasted for it? Yes, but I'm not surprised that he did that. Does that make sense? Not it. Yeah. I mean, it does make sense. Not everybody has to like everything though. You know, like that's also true. Everyone's a lot like, some people like pineapple on their pizza. You know, it's, it's, that's the great thing about, yeah, I know. See, like yeah, I, you stick I know. your tongue out, but there are some people who like it. It's a great thing about pizza. It's like, yeah. I can sit over here and get what I want on my pizza. And you can sit over here and get what you want on your pizza. We don't have to like the same that's thing. Right, baby. You, know? you can even, you can even, that's right. Personal pan, you know, get half one, half oh, the yeah. other, whatever you want to do, you know, like not everybody has to like it, you know, like, what kind of killed me about like he was honest, you know, he gave it a shot. He at least watched it yeah. for a half, but he was honest, you know, you know, again, it's like not everybody likes hockey, but hockey people really love oh, hockey. There's no like in between. Like, You've ever noticed that you yeah. either love hockey or you exactly don't right. need hockey in your life at all. Right. Uh, there's no casual hockey fans. I feel like that's exactly right. You know? And so it's perfectly fine that he wasn't into it. it like, to each his own, I get. There were a lot of people sure. who obviously were, but there's still a lot of people who aren't. But, you know, at the same time, 
what I found was funny because I was listening to his podcast when he said this, you know, he made sure to use Iowa in the headline of his podcast the next day. So it was like a little clickbaity. He drew Mm. people in and basically spent like four or five minutes saying, yeah, I saw this. I saw this. Caitlin Clark, blah, blah, blah. And then I turned it off and I watched NBA. (laughs) Cute commercial. Hilarious. So he was fine using the Iowa as the clickbait to get people to listen to the podcast, but then yeah. he was like, he crept all over it at the end. <laughs> you know, so that's that. I got. I have more of a problem with that than yeah. anything else. Me if too. I'm being honest, exactly. At least talk about what your because like is going to be. Because again, I was listening to it, and then you know he he cuts, and I'm like, next thing you know, he's got commercials, you know, going in the pod, and I'm like, hold it, what? So that's it. That's all he's going to say. <laughs> about this game because he's because he is he really knows basketball and i was kind of looking forward to hearing his thoughts on what he thought from what he saw yeah yeah in that game you know he talks about basketball all the time no i know like no doubt about that because like you know when when he does his pods like him and bill simmons both they're you know they both love the nba and that's great but you know sit there and so i'll kind of go through the description it's like when it's nba heavy i'm not really into that you know exactly more for the NFL and, and other stuff like that. Tommy, bacon, ham, pineapple. I've never done that. I mean, you got I, I have tried the Canadian bacon and pineapple. This has been a long time ago, back in the day. Bacon wasn't cool. as bad as a lot of people think. I think bacon and ham is a little bit of a that's, that's too pig. That's a little too much. A little bit too smoky. Like yeah. it gets a little sweet when you've got that much kind of smoky, fatty yeah. goodness in there. <clears throat> You gotta have something like the pepperoni or sausage with yeah. some spices to break it up a little yes. bit. Yes, yes. I, I I like the bacon uh, for the crunch and the taste, so yeah. I don't mind a little bacon. I really don't. Ham, it depends on the place because some people, some places do like the big old like chunks of ham. Mm-hmm. That's a little. That's that that I no, I'm good. I don't need the big. Do chunks you like of ham, like, like the like little the... chopped up kind of ham pieces? Is yeah, like? the minced. I would rather have minced there if I was go. gonna go that route. Minced ham. Uh, but it's, it would be down the way a little bit. Right. Tommy's asking if you ever had sausage and bacon for breakfast. Uh, yes, I have. So I've totally, <laughs> and I, I'm being honest with you, Tommy, I do. And that's, but I don't put them all in my mouth at the same time on bread with sauce either. So it's a little bit different. I think you and I, pepperoni and sausage, mm, yeah. right? That's number one. That's my number one right that's there. Number one. Pepperoni and sausage. That's no my, doubt. That's my good. I, I will also throw some mushrooms on there and be happy. But if I'm going meat, that's it right there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, not a big meat or not a big meat, not a big uh, mushroom. Like I'll take it. I can yeah. take it or leave it basically, but I'll never order it specifically. Um, the wife kind of likes the, you know, Supreme with some peppers and oh, onions yeah. and, and stuff the like Supreme that. Supreme gets to be too much. Then the, the yeah. toppings overtake the pizza and sometimes they fall off. Like Got to have good cheese if you're going to do it. You do. Way, I think. You absolutely do. Because I feel like some places skimp on the cheese in lieu of the toppings. Mm-hmm. And that just doesn't work. Then you got toppings all over the plate. And my wife's getting out right. the fork and the knife. Stuff's falling off. That yeah, right. like, I, no. Pass. Hard yeah. pass. You need that. <laughs> You need that cheese grease to break yes. up those vegetables. That's what you Thank need. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Oh, Michael chiming in. Meat lovers pizza is king. Oh, it is. And if I you mean, ever big cheese pizza, when we go back to see my dad in okay. Kansas, there's a big cheese pizza. I don't know. Did they ever have big cheese out here? I don't think so. No, oh, I've never man, heard of that big one. cheese. It's been there forever and it used to be a at least where we lived it seemed like it was a you know decent chain it's one of the only ones that i've ever seen they've got it like we always get the meat lovers oh, very sounds good. good very it does good sound good yeah next time i go back i might have to try to freeze one and bring it back and we'll well done or take <laughs> well done all right well that's gonna do it we wrapped it up i know tommy wanted us to uh to go you know like three hours or something like that. I apologize for falling short on that. If we would have had Jesse in here, could for have gone longer. Beauties, we would have been a little bit longer. I want to know if his company showed up on time. I know. That, I'm probably gonna not. Need to know, I'm going to need to know that because if they didn't, oh, oh, oh. not going to be happy. I know. I know. All right. Well, have a great weekend. Weekend full of basketball. Got a yeah. little bit of uh, Notre Dame uh, media going on. 
this weekend we're going to talk to the we're going to talk to both Mike Denbrock and Al Golden tomorrow. So we'll have nice. some of their thoughts on Monday's show next week. And of course, we'll have plenty of basketball and more in rapid fire. So <laughs> Salty says, "Oops, where did it go?" Salty says Jesse would have added another 30 minutes. Would have. He would have. We got, you know, basically we got a half hour for each guy essentially. Yeah. And if we had a third guy, that's 90 minutes. I'm just saying. That's right. All right. Well, have a great weekend, and we will talk to you on Monday on IB Nation Sports Talk.